There's no prizes for guessing what series of games most people would immediately associate with the company that's the subject of today's video. When core design comes up, Tomb Raider is naturally the first thing that springs to mind, what with it being such a hugely influential and popular series and all that. While the adventures of Lara Croft are something that we've covered in a fair bit of detail already, there is a lot more to call than just those games. Before Tomb Raider, they were a studio that released some excellent games, and more than a few big hits on platforms like the Mega Drive and the Amiga. During Tomb Raider's salad days, they were able to use that game's success to experiment with other projects, having the room to create some unique little games that were usually worthy of note. And of course, it all does come around to the project that was their cash cow, finally being the thing that would cause their tragic downfall. They were one of the more creative and classic British game studios throughout most of their existence, and not only did they obviously survive and thrive in the jump to 3D that claimed a great deal of their contemporaries, they had a style and aesthetic that persevered from their days as a small 16-bit studio to the time when they were one of the hottest names in the whole industry. And so it's finally time to tell the whole story of Core Design from their splintered off beginnings in the late 80s, to eventually being swallowed up and closed down in 2010. Let's go. The core design story just about exclusively takes place in Derby, the city where a street is now named after their most famous creation. But before core design ever took shape, there was a small group of people with a rather odd little game for the Commodore 64 that would be released by Sheffield's Gremlin Graphics and would become a pretty sizeable hit. The small group consisted of Chris Shrigley, Andy Green, Robert Toon and Terry Lloyd, and their game was 1985's Bounder. This story of a perpetually bouncing tennis ball-like creature was created by the quartet in a couple of months, taking a bit of inspiration from the look of Capcom's arcade game x Dexies, and being one of the first C64 games to really plunge into parallax scrolling, just beating Sensible Software's parallax to the punch. Gremlin didn't hesitate to snap the title up, paying the team £2,000 each for their work. The result was their biggest critical hit to date, and a great commercial success for a game that was very fun and addicting, despite its rather high level of difficulty. And so this little Derby team established a working relationship with Gremlin. Back in Sheffield, Greg Holmes was also able to get his foot in the door with the company, creating the excellent Jack the Nipper, a classic arcade adventure sort of game where you play as a chaotic little brat named Jack on his quest to be as naughty as he possibly can. This was another sizeable hit, and both this game and Bounder would receive ports to a good chunk of the big platforms of the time, not to mention sequels later on down the road. These are a few of the figures who'd ultimately be responsible for the formation of Core, but over the next couple of years they would continue to work on various projects. The Derby team travelled to Sheffield and back to co-develop Future Night with company originals like Sean Hollingworth and Peter Harrop, in a move that did cause a little bit of friction. Other games such as Footballer of the Year and Skate Crazy are also headed up by this bunch, and a young coder and artist by the name of Simon Phipps also joins the fray in Derby, working on games such as the aforementioned Skate Crazy and um, Masters of the Universe. Less said about that one the better. Still, putting the games aside, this was a time when Finns weren't necessarily all right at Gremlin Graphics. It was a period where US Gold's head honcho, Jeff Brown, had taken a controlling stake in the company and was pushing ports and licenses onto them, trying to make them a software house on the level of something like Ocean, one that, unlike the Manchester boys, he didn't have to give half of his profits to in a deal that he forever regretted. Gremlin was starting to become a bit more corporate, original boss Ian Stewart was starting to retreat further into the background, and some of Gremlin's original programmers were becoming a little disgruntled. This results in the first company exodus. Peter Harrop and Sean Hollingworth leave with recently hired sales executive Tony Kavanagh to form Teak, later known as Chrysalis. This mass departure is a body blow for Gremlin, and despite Jeff Brown reading them all a riot act and threatening that they'd never work in the industry again if they went through with the move, it happens anyway and, well obviously they did work in the industry again. The man hired to replace Tony Kavanagh as Gremlin's sales executive? Well that'll be our boss man for this story. 
Jeremy Heath-Smith, who joined Gremlin in 1987 after being poached from software distributors LeisureSoft. He moves up to Sheffield, and for a little while things get back to a sort of normality. Gremlin creates an office in Derby to house the team there, and stop them having to endlessly commute up and down the M1 to Sheffield, with Greg Holmes being sent there to manage things. It's during this time that sequels to games like Bounder and Jack the Nipper were created, Rebounder and Coconut Capers, both of which are pretty good and somewhat different to the original games, although neither were quite as successful. Jeremy Heath Smith soon finds himself in Derby as well, and it's at this time when recent history starts to repeat itself. Frustrated with Gremlin's struggles, Jeff Brown looks to try and consolidate the company a little. The group of satellite officers that they had weren't seen to be going anywhere. The one in Lincoln soon gets closed down, and it soon becomes clear that the Derby office is going to suffer a similar fate. While the home base at Sheffield is safe for now, less and less is happening there, and it appears as though the end goal of all of this was perhaps to move the whole company to Birmingham, closer to Centre Gold. Jeremy Heath-Smith comes into the Derby office with the news that the Derby team are either going to have to be made redundant or move up to Sheffield, something that none of them are prepared to do. And with that, well, the second exodus happens. The Gremlin Derby team almost totally becomes the original core design. Shrigley, Holmes, Phipps and Company, along with the likes of Andy Green, Dave Pridmore and Terry Lloyd. Gremlin's co-founder, Kevin Norburn, concerned by the situation in Sheffield, will also join them. Eventually, Heathsmith, Holmes and Norburn put up money to form the company, with Heathsmith's investment crucially giving him the majority. In all honesty, it's not that long at all before Smith buys Holmes and Norburn out, leaving him at the head of the company, while Chris Shrigley also leaves after an intense argument with Smith over promised shares. Still, the majority of ex-Gremlin Derby coders stay with Core, looking for something different from the rather downcast final months working for the Sheffield company. This loss of talent and company confusion could have easily signalled the end for Gremlin, of course. It's the sort of thing that would have killed other companies. Here at least the story goes on. Gremlin reclaim their independence after Jeff Brown leaves the picture, Ian Stewart takes back control, and the company becomes stronger than ever in the early 1990s. For that story, I refer you to the big old video I've already done on Gremlin. For now, the company in Derby hit the ground running pretty sharpish. They work with Firebird and Activision on their first two titles, arcade ports of Sega's Action Fighter and Dynamite Ducks. The deal with Firebird, taken just before the time that the label switched over from Telecomsoft to Microprose, will be the more lasting one, and the result of it will be their first big original hit, the game that's often seen as the forefather to a certain Miss Quaft's tomb-based adventures, and one that's quietly amongst the UK scene's most influential games of the period, even if it's also probably the most frustrating one. There's no real prizes for guessing where Simon Phipps and Terry Lloyd's inspiration for the game that would become 1989's Rick Dangerous came from, but specifically they felt that there hadn't really been a game that captured the excitement of the first few minutes of Raiders of the Lost Ark, with Indiana Jones grabbing treasures, dodging traps and so on. There had been indie games before now, of course, but Simon and Terry didn't feel as though the likes of Atari's Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom conveyed that proper Daredevil experience. Through watching Raiders basically on a loop, using it for various level locations such as an underground base and a castle, and adding a bunch of ideas of their own, Rick Dangerous quickly took its form, with the aim of creating a platformer that was a fair bit different to the normal sort of thing you would find on the 8-bit micros. There's the many, many traps, of course. The Rick Dangerous team wanted a game where you would face peril in virtually every step you took, and so naturally the game is littered with them. Spikes coming out of nowhere, arrows that hurtle towards you, enemy ambushes, all sorts of things that are here to kill you instantly. The initial design of the game called for even more traps, such as crumbling floors and moving spike walls, although these were dropped as a consideration for porting the game to the lesser powered likes of the ZX Spectrum. This is also the main reason why the game only scrolls vertically, and not horizontally. And of course, there's lots of jumping. 
Leaps that will often require great precision, or the ability to avoid traps and obstacles in mid-air, not to mention dodging any trouble that will meet you on the ground. To achieve this, the team gave Rick a jump not dissimilar to that of Mario's. You have full control over your hero when he's in the air. This deviated from the norm somewhat. Most of the 8-bit micro-platformers that followed in the footsteps of Manic Miner stuck to that game's very fixed jump that you had zero control over once you left the ground, but such a system wouldn't have worked in a game like Rick Dangerous. And of course, you've got plenty of enemies. Everything from Nazis to evil spirits are here to thwart Rick's quest for treasure. It's here in the character design where the game gets a bit of a humorous edge. It's all a little cartoony, and there's a big old wah that plays whenever an enemy or Rick bites the dust, said voice being provided by Simon Phipps himself. <laughs> While Rick Dangerous was principally for the 16-bit computers, Core wanted to make sure it was good on every platform, and so a good deal of care and attention was put into making sure that versions of the game for the C64, Specky and Amstrad were thoroughly solid, even if they were a bit smaller. Other considerations for helping port the game included making sure that all of Rick's actions could be performed with the joystick, jumping, firing his gun, setting a bomb, and using his stick which principally pushes buttons, but can also freeze enemies. All of this is done with a simple button and direction scheme that's pretty quick to grasp, and also allows Rick to climb on certain parts of walls. The game ends up coming together quite smoothly, being developed over the course of four months, and it was just about done in around July of 1988. However, it was delayed a little due to Firebird being taken over by Microprose. Still, the new bosses at Microprose liked the game too, and saw plenty of sales potential. And soon enough, it came out in the middle of 1989, complete with a little comic book drawn by Ian Gibson of 2000 AD fame. The only minor quibble that the team had with the handling of the release was that the commissioned cover art of the game was a little more serious than they would have liked, with the very indie-esque realistically proportioned man on the front not exactly being representative of the game's character. Despite this, the game was a big hit indeed. It went to number one all over Europe, and got a lot of big critical notices, with scores mostly in the high 80s to 90s. A marvellous hit indeed, although everyone did also note the game's difficulty, and with good reason. My god this game is brutal. Infamously frustrating. They certainly didn't mince on traps. Rick Dangerous will try and kill you in a thousand different ways, and while sometimes it might seem fairly obvious where to go to avoid being killed, it won't stop you from being endlessly sent packing. And being that this is a 1989 game, obviously it's limited lives too. You get just six of them. The difficulty was a concern during development, and there were some heated debates about how hard the game was, the feeling nowadays from the developers is that it was indeed far too difficult, but at the time they ran into a classic trouble. Because they were the ones who were playtesting the game, and they'd playtested the game so much, they'd gotten very good at it, and so they weren't able to accurately judge just how challenging the game was, there was no one impartial to do that. Some parts in particular, like the pixel-perfect triple jump in the Egyptian stage, are infamous. One of the hardest challenges you will find in basically any platform game ever made, even before you understand that, again, you would only have a limited number of chances to do it. If you bested Rick Dangerous back in the day, without cheating? In my opinion, you have every right to call yourself a gaming god. Or a sadomasochist. The difficulty would lead to the game getting a few critical kickings when it was re-reviewed on the budget circuit. Amiga Power actually gave it all of 17% in 1994, for example. Playing it can feel like friggin' torture, even if it is also well made. And yet, it is one of the most influential UK platformers of them all. Closer to home, it is seen as the forefather to the company's most famous creation. Before Tomb Raider, there was Rick Dangerous. But it's also had influence on a good few modern platformers, the likes of Spelunky, or A Thousand and One Spikes. Something about the aesthetics and the challenge has taken the game far beyond the European retro scene, and it actually does feel somewhat more contemporary than a lot of other Euro platform games. 
Still, I would say that if you're going to play it today, yeah, you're probably going to want some sort of infinite lives trainer enabled. And even then, you should prepare to die and prepare to be, well, more than a little bit annoyed. The great success of Rick Dangerous meant that a sequel would naturally follow, and Rick Dangerous 2 doesn't change too much really. You've got the same sense of humour, and same traps and so forth, only we've got a more futuristic setting with Rick taking on aliens led by the big guy, the villain from the first game, in a set of all new stages. You can take the first four one in any order before going to the big guy's base. The graphics are nicer, and Rick's dynamite from the first game is now replaced by a time bomb that he can also slide along the ground, adding a bit more variety to the puzzles. If you like Rick Dangerous, then you'll undoubtedly like this too, and I would say that on the whole, it's a more balanced and better sequel. Still very hard, and still keen on the occasional cheap joke at your expense. Such as, of course, the little tutorial section at the beginning telling you to press a button that will happily send a poisoned arrow directly into your face. Of the two games, this one is definitely the more fun one, a game that's less predisposed towards parts where the precision required is just way too freaking much. There's not as many pixel perfect jumps and the like in Rick Dangerous 2. You will still probably want that trainer, mind you. Rick Dangerous 2 wasn't necessarily meant to be the end of the series. Indeed, it ends on something of a cliffhanger with the big guy getting away and Rick in hot pursuit. But the team behind the game largely went their separate ways following Rick Dangerous 2, with a bunch of them going off to jobs in America. And so the series came to a close. Terry Lloyd did work a little bit on a Rick Dangerous-esque game for the SNES that was going to be called Danger Dan, but this never got finished, and not a whole lot is known about it. Simon Phipps would still be at Core Design for the time being, mind you, and he was quickly establishing himself as one of the young studio's top creators. Not just with Rick Dangerous, but with another game that he'd actually started working on before this one even came to fruition. And that game is next. The atmosphere at Core Design under Jeremy Heath Smith was like a fair few of the classic old studios that we've looked at in the past. There's plenty of hard work, but also a lot of playing around. The core design boys would have a fair bit of fun in the office, something that was a holdover from the Gremlin Derby days. Occasionally you just might want to call off and, I don't know, surf down some stairs with an advertising board or whatever. The young coders' propensity for loud noises didn't necessarily make them popular when they were in shared offices with other, more serious business firms, but things would naturally get more and more raucous as core graduated to their own place. Heath Smith generally endeavoured to keep things relaxed as opposed to corporate, making the decisions on games that should be worked on, and then largely letting the teams get on with it without too much in the way of supervision. And even in times when the team were working hard and putting the late hours in, well, while Jeremy Heath Smith couldn't code a lick, he would usually at least stay around to make the tease. And these folks certainly could work hard, right from the off. To take Simon Phipps as an example, during the making of Rick Dangerous he was getting up, going to the office, working all day on that game, then he'd come home, eat, and then stay up until around 2am working for another game entirely, a personal project that he'd create solely over the course of about 18 months on his Atari ST. And that game was Switchblade. For Simon, Switchblade served a bunch of purposes, filling a lot of interests learning how to make a big old piece of code, making something inspired by old arcade adventure titles like Ultimate's Underworld, and a big interest in things like anime and science fiction. There's a whole lot of Akira, Blade Runner, and Mad Maxi vibes running through it. As the project went on and Simon got further into developing other games at core, it became an oddity. He'd be working on much smoother and cleaner code when creating the likes of Rick Dangerous, and then he'd go home and try to work through the more jumbled up code of Switchblade, originally started when he was a relative beginner. Sure, he could have gone and cleaned the whole thing up, but would it have really been the same? As mentioned, it was a much longer project. Switchblade took 18 months of Simon Phipps' spare time before he revealed it to the folks at Core Design, and they were quite impressed by it. 
Simon has said of the game in interviews for Mags Like Retro Gamer that a bunch of the building blocks for Rick Dangerous can be found in Switchblade, which is a bit weird considering that Switchblade was released later. The game itself sees you play as a warrior named Hero in a 128 screen flip screen subterranean area called the Undercity, and he has to find the 16 fragments of the sacred Fireblade in order to use it against an evil entity named Havoc. It does feel like an evolution of the classic flip screen adventure, the Jet Set Willies and Underworlds and the like, only Hero is obviously a lot more capable, with a few attacks that he can pull off with the use of a power bar. He can use his strikes to break blocks which will reveal hidden areas and open passages, while another gimmick is that parts of a screen are often hidden from view until Hero enters them. This bit of inspiration was taken from the earlier Houston game Wanorama. Simon did pretty much everything with the exception of the music, a typically excellent soundtrack created by Ben Daglish, who would be the muser on a fair few of Core's games. When it came to the question of publishing the game, Core were not yet in a position where they could do any publishing themselves, they were still pretty small. It didn't take long for them to find a suitable candidate though. Jeremy Heath Smith called up his old boss, and indeed most of the company's old boss. Ian Stewart of Gremlin was more than happy to take the game on, and Switchblade finally saw release in December of 1989, first on the Atari ST, and then on to other platforms. Like a lot of Core's games from this period, both the 16-bit and 8-bit versions are quality. It works very well no matter what platform it's on, and it was received handsomely just about everywhere. Ultimately, it wasn't as big a success as Rick Dangerous, but it still stands as one of Core's most memorable, and indeed one of their very best titles from this period, still standing as one of the best classic flip-screen platformers from back in the day. Now we are going to have to jump forward in the timeline a little bit. While Switchblade did get a sequel a year or so later, that didn't have anything to do with Simon Phipps or core design. Switchblade 2 is a very good sequel, and the original creator thought pretty well of it, but it was released by Gremlin and coded in the main by George Allen, later famous for Zool. So for something that's more of a spiritual successor to Switchblade and is also by Core and Simon Phipps, you do well to look at 1992's excellent Wolf Child. This game was largely the creation of Phipps, who did the art and design, and Bob Kirkland, who did the code. Weirdly, the name was inspired by an inscription on a belt worn by fellow Core comrade Bob Churchill, who we'll get to when we do Chuck Wock, and the game sees you play as Saul Morrow, an Olympic hero who also happens to be a genius that gives himself the power to turn into a wolfman after his scientist father is kidnapped. He uses this power to storm the island base of the Chimera organisation in order to stop their operations and rescue his papa. The main gameplay gimmick in Wolfchild is that Saul can increase his health beyond full capacity, and when he does he will transform into the wolf creature, which gives him the power to fire various projectiles. Therefore it's very much a game about conserving your health. While this isn't the Incredible Hulk and Saul can still attack as a human, the wolf form is considerably more powerful. The original game has five very solid levels and does take on something of a Strider-esque hue, albeit with smaller graphics. There's a lot of focus on nice surrounds and some big set-piece boss fights, and some more excellent music. While this isn't the first core game to feature the tunes of the brilliant Martin Iverson, it's the first we've heard in this video and his soundtrack is a perfect fit for the game. Wolfchild was another very well received game on the Amiga, but it's also the first game we've seen here that got a lot of console ports, largely thanks to Virgin Games, there's a Mega Drive version, SNES version, Master System Game Gear version, and probably most notably a Mega CD version, which all the other big console ports were based on. This version, which was actually published by JVC, with the aim of being a lead title for their all-in-one Mega Drive and CD system at the Wonder Mega, features a new intro, enhanced graphics, and a whole load of new levels. 
you pretty much get double the game in fact, although the assets are the same as the Amiga version. Console reviewers were generally a lot harsher on Wolfchild than the Amiga lot were, but I think that's a bit of a shame. It's a very nice and dark little platformer, no matter what you play it on. Although I would be inclined to say that the original Amiga form of Wolfchild is the tighter experience, even if the graphics are better on the Mega CD. The first couple of years of course saw a good few other projects come around that don't really fit into any series or what have you, meaning that it's now time for the first of a couple of roundups. Here's a look at some of the other games that Core released in the time when they were flitting between the 8 bits and the 16 bits. One that's of particular big interest here is their first licensed game, something that, well it is a pretty weird license to make a game out of. Simon Phipps had a chat with Jeremy Heath Smith one day, Smith said he was chatting with Virgin Games and that hopefully they would get a license to make a game based on either Judge Dredd or Monty Python's Flying Circus. Phipps and presumably everybody else were hoping for Dredd, I mean that's an obvious one isn't it? And a few weeks later Jeremy gathered everyone together with the good news that they'd got a license for Monty Python, so hey ho. The Dredd license ultimately went to the sales curve who made a pretty dull game out of it. So how do you make a game out of Python? The initial idea was to make a graphic adventure that would pay tribute to or indeed recreate famous sketches. As Phipps puts it on his website, you'd take a dead parrot to a shop, there'd be an appropriate scene, and you'd get a fish license out of it which you'd then take elsewhere, and so on. Another idea was a whole load of mini games that were dedicated to famous sketches, something perhaps similar to the Three Stooges game made by Cinemaware. All good ideas but neither really took off, as while they'd have worked on the Amiga and the ST, there needed to be versions for the 8-bit micros too. I mean, can you imagine a LucasArts-esque adventure running on a bloody Spectrum cassette tape? Thought not. Still, it was fun coming up with the process and making the game, if only because every meeting either between the team or with the publisher usually descended into endless quotes from the show. As the classic line from Not The Nine O'Clock News goes, whenever two or three are gathered together in one place, then they shall perform the parrot sketch. What we end up with is more of an action game. You play as a Gumby, picked out due to every Python having played one, and move through various levels and gameplay styles, all chock full of Python references and done in the style of Terry Gilliam's animation. On one level you might be a fish and it's a shoot em up of sorts where you're taking down half bees, another might be a Rick Dangerous-esque platformer. There's plenty of odd touches, like the score counting backwards from 100 million, the occasional interruption for sketch type vignettes, and the cheese lock copy protection system, some of which were suggested by Virgin, and Phipps says that in the end there were over 100 Python references in the game. And to be honest, the game isn't really that bad. It's a short affair with only a few levels, and the gameplay isn't going to win any awards, but the graphics are absolutely excellent and it does capture a certain anarchic spirit. It's a pretty good license game made with a license that's not exactly straightforward. Not all core games were major affairs like this one, of course. We have other simpler arcade style affairs that are still pretty good. Here for example is Carve Up by Robert Toon and Terry Lloyd. The inspiration for this game is obvious, it's a riff on Jalico's classic arcade game City Connection, only there's a bunch more power ups and settings. Much like City Connection, you control a car and you have to drive over every bit of the stage, avoiding enemies, jumping up and down between levels. It may not be original, but it's just as engaging and addicting as the arcade it's based on. Similarly derivative, and also quite good, is Torvac the Warrior, a side-scrolling platform that clearly takes a bit of inspiration from Taito's Rastan. Your barbarian wields his axe or sword or whatever about all over the place and, well he just has to get from A to B, smashing all in his path. 
As far as Rastan type hack and slashers go, it's a perfectly decent title. Neither of these games are major releases as such, but they're pretty fun, and also published by Core themselves. There's also a couple of other games that Core developed for their old bosses. Despite the nature of the split, all is pretty amicable between Core Design and Gremlin Graphics. This trio aren't necessarily the best of games, but they do include Impossimole, the fifth game in Gremlin's Monty Mole series. Impossimole is different to the others, playing sort of like a cross between a typical Monty Mole title and a not quite as evil Rick Dangerous, although the game is still quite hard. Honestly, it is the weakest of the Monty Mole titles by far, and not one that's particularly well remembered. Then you have Skids, a game where you control either a BMX or a skateboard, and go around levels picking up trash within a quite strict time limit. It's, uh, it's okay. It plays like a follow-up to the earlier Gremlin game Skate Crazy. The controls take a little bit of time to get used to. It may seem like you need to button mash, but there's a bit more timing involved here. Not a bad game, but not a memorable one. The same would apply to Axel's Magic Hammer, which is a generic Euro platformer. It's flip screen and you get to beat up enemies and knock through blocks with your aforementioned hammer. The general vibe of the title, not to mention the name, makes me think that this was an attempt to create an Alex Kidd-esque title. And uh, you should probably just go and play Alex Kidd instead, as this one just isn't that good. All that said, there was surely an awful lot more worth and enjoyment in making something like Axel's Magic Hammer, as opposed to making Saint and Greavesy for Grand Slam, probably the least important core design game of them all, although there are amusing stories around its creation. With the licence being based on a show where two ex-footballers talk about football, naturally, the logical path for the game here was a football-themed quiz show based on the tie-in board game, in the era when every friggin' TV series had a tie-in board game, with a couple of Football of the Year-esque elements such as scoring a quick penalty for a bonus. Other than that, well, hopefully you know your 1980s football. Simon Phipps says that he has the question, who are the shrimpers, embedded into his head forever, thanks to this game, the first in the game set of 2000 questions that were painstakingly typed in by hand, and as a Southend United fan, this happens to make me smile. Also, having to work on this game was apparently the thing that caused Greg Holmes to not only leave Core Design, but to leave the entire games industry. Lastly, Core Design continued their forays into self-publishing with two pretty simple and not particularly memorable arcade-esque titles, the top-down run and gunner Warzone and the top-down space shooter Frenetic. One of them's a bit like Mercs, and the other one's a bit like Xenon 2 Mega Blast. Eh, they're not going to stick in the memory for long after you've turned them off. Still, the continued trips into self-publishing show the company's ambition to not just be a small studio, but to be a full-blown software house, and we will see some pretty big games that were not just developed by Core, but published by them too, even if they are mostly known as a developer. For now, we've got another big series to come. Before the arrival of Tomb Raider, Core were mostly tied together with another mascot of sorts, as close as they had to one, anyway and this character couldn't be more different to Lara Croft if they'd tried. Chuck Rock was the star of Core Design's 16-bit days, a big, bald, overweight, stone-jawed caveman who liked to rock out. Just the title sequence alone, with Chuck and his family playing the game's excellent music, was enough to pull an awful lot of people in and give the company its biggest hit to date. The trio behind the game consisted of people who'd all got their start in Core, Bob Churchill, Lee Pullen and Chris Lon had all previously worked on games like Rick Dangerous 2 and Frenetic, and of the three, Pullen was the man responsible for creating the iconic character. 
Once again, the creation of Chuckwook was something that was designed to fill a hole. There weren't too many games with a prehistoric setting out there, and the hero himself was also designed to be, well, very different to the likes of Mario. It's a different sort of platformer, one that's designed to be a little bit comic and, indeed, a little bit ruder than the norm. The plot itself is simple enough. Chuck's at home watching football and drinking beer when his wife Ophelia is kidnapped by the town's local weirdo, the rather unfortunately named Gary Gritter. Obviously this was back in the early 90s when that character's inspiration was still very much on the telly and not… you know. Anyway, our hero gets his clothes on, sort of, and he's off to save her. Chuck doesn't have much in the way of attacks, but he does have his dreaded belly push, being able to see off enemies with a strike of his giant, booze-hardened stomach. Most of the game is, like any platformer, all about getting from A to B, and happily you don't have to collect a load of fins in Chuck Rock, although there is a bit more to the game than just thumping enemies with your gut. The gimmick of Chuck Rock is right there in the title. Our man can chuck rocks about all over the place, and this is a much more efficient way of dealing with enemies than getting in close for the belly push. Not only that, the various rocks have other uses, as a platform for reaching high ledges or throwing into the middle of spike traps, as a weight that can propel Chuck via a seesaw, or as a sort of shield that can protect Chuck from enemies dealing damage from above. So there is a bit more to them than you think. Still, while the gameplay here is pretty good, Chuck mainly earns goodwill through the amusing presentation, rocking music, and the slightly rude nature of it all. It's something you might even see in the pages of Viz, if it had a few more swear words. And it was enough for the game to be a great success, and a thoroughly deserved one. This is a Euro platformer, and while some people can be down on such fins, this is one that absolutely has its own identity and style. This game naturally got a ton of ports, most of them being published through Virgin. You can play Chuck Rock almost anywhere, from the Mega Drive and the SNES, to the Master System and the Game Boy, another special enhanced Mega CD version, and most obscure of all, a rather cut down Commodore 64 version of the game, which was only released in Italy and was, by some distance, the last core design game to feature on an 8-bit micro. This port, made by Genius, is one of the rarest games around for the computer. Most of the game's ports had some of the lewder references and parts taken out of it. For example, neither the Mega Drive or SNES version features the bit where you have to dodge the drop-ins coming out of a particularly large dinosaur's arse. All that said, Chuck Rock is still plenty of fun on most of the platforms it came out for, one of those games that would really enhance the Derby Studios reputation and name across the board. The Chuck Rock team wanted to quickly get to work on a sequel, but plans for this were temporarily put on hold. First they had to make a game mandated by Jeremy Heath Smith that is kind of similar to the Chuck titles, and so probably fits better here than it does anywhere else. And that game is Wonder Dog. Who is Wonder Dog? Well, this super dog who comes down to Earth from the planet of K9 is a mascot for JVC and their Wonder Mega system. The Japanese company picked Core out to work with them, and this was the company's introduction to the Mega CD, which we will be seeing plenty more of in a bit. Core were the ones who came up with the character, and the Chuck Wook team was picked to make it. Initially they didn't really want to, but in the end they were kind of forced. Despite that, well, honestly the Mega CD game isn't that terrible. It's colourful at least. Yes, our hero does have fast moves and the like that could make him appear to be a bit of a sonic ripoff, but controlling the canine isn't all that bad once you get to grips with him, and the level design is pretty nice, lots of secrets and not so much of the typical crappy Euro platformer tropes. Martin Iverson's got some nice red book tunes going on here too. On the whole, I would say that Wonder Dog gets a little bit of a bad rap, although I wouldn't bother with the later port of the game back to Amiga. The graphics are much worse, and the controls really don't transfer over that well.
With Wonder Dog done, the team of Rockers could get on with making their proper sequel, and said game would be the absolutely brilliant Chuck Rock 2 Son of Chuck from 1993. This one's a little different. Chuck Rock is older, fatter, and earning a wad of cash as the owner of Chuck Motors. Naturally, this makes people jealous, so he ends up getting kidnapped, and it's up to Chuck's son, Chuck Jr., to save him. This badass baby controls a bit different to Chuck. Obviously he can't pick up rocks, but he does have a big old club to swim about, and he can move boulders around simply by hitting them. So while he doesn't have Chuck's defensive capability, he's more of an attacker, and he can also balance on his club to avoid traps on the ground. The game itself is, honestly, superb. It's much more of a looker than the original Chuck, pulling off some quite impressive technical feats in its various versions, and the change in gameplay for me is one for the better. It's nice to see the team taking a big risk to change the mechanics of the original so much, and even nicer for it to pay off. If you've never bothered with this game, then I really do recommend that you try this one, either on the excellent Mega CD version, or on the Amiga. It wasn't as successful as the first title, but it is a triumph of a game. The third game in the Chuck Rock series would be more of a spin-off, 1994's BC Racers, a game principally created for the Mega CD, although there were also 32X, 3DO, and DOS versions. Pick your favourite character from the Chuck Rock universe, and race against the others over various appropriately themed tracks. The premise of the game automatically made people think of it as a Mario Kart clone, although the game itself doesn't actually play a lot like Mario Kart. Instead you have elements inspired by games such as F-Zero and Road Rash, where the racers earn a special turbo boost after completing a lap, and they can also beat the crap out of each other with weapons in the absence of any power-ups, meaning that drivers can be taken out of the race completely if their energy drops to zero. The game itself is pretty average. There's some technically nice things about it, but it's dogged by a poor frame rate and a harsh difficulty. Not a big critical or commercial success, and these days it's more famous for trivia. This spin-off was designed by a certain fellow named Toby Gard, who would go on from this game into… well I imagine you know the rest already. Just can't get away from Lara, can you? BC Racers would end up being the last appearance for Chuck Rock, which is a little bit of a shame. There were some plans made by the original Chuck Rock team for a third platformer. This third game would have most likely seen the developers complete the Chuck Rock family by having you play as Ophelia, Chuck's good lady wife. Unfortunately, it never really got anywhere. It appears as though Lee Pullen went off to work for Malibu Interactive in the States, and the loss of one of the trio brought the series to an end. Much later in the day, it said that a 3D revival of Chuck Rock was one of the last games that Core Design were working on before they were bought up by Rebellion, although not a great deal of detail has ever been leaked on that one. Still, Chuck Rock would stand as one of Core Design's most famous creations, and certainly the one people mainly associated with them before the 32-bit era. If it weren't for the fortunes of this fat caveman, his antithesis may well have never existed. Outside of Chuck Rock, Core Design would create and release a very wide variety of games in the 16-bit era. They tried on an awful lot of hats, and while most of what we've seen so far are platformers, they would be a lot more diverse as the generation went on. So we're going to split the rest of their 16-bit work into common themes. First up, we're going to look at their 3D exploits, mostly concentrating on their games for the Mega CD. Then we'll have a look at their rather odd set of adventure titles, and then of course we'll have the big old roundup of their more classic arcade action and platform titles, where there's plenty more in the way of classics to come. For now, we'll look at the 3D games that did see Core take a bit of a place as one of the more technologically forward thinking studios of the era. Indeed, we're going to have to wind the clock back a little bit to 1990, so we can look at their first 3D game and another big hit for the studio, the somewhat groundbreaking Corporation, or Cybercop if you're in the States. Corporation is the first game that Core Design published, and it was made by Synthetic Designs, a small studio won by Kevin Ballmer, a former Gremlin guy. And it was a success. 
The game turned out to be one of the company's biggest hits in the era, probably because there wasn't an awful lot like it. The game is commonly cited as one of the earliest first person shooters, coming out a couple years before Wolfenstein 3D, although really the games are very different indeed. If you try to play Corporation as an FPS, blasting everything you see, well you'll run out of ammo almost immediately, and your death will come very fast. This game actually has more in common with a dungeon crawler, like Eye of the Beholder. You're mainly supposed to be stealthy, avoiding conflict, trying not to be seen, and only fighting when you have to. You shoot out security cameras before they spot you, grab equipment to help you out, hack the computer to unlock the elevator, and infiltrate the building further. There's plenty of RPG elements, an inventory, an encumbrance system, and PSI abilities to level up that might allow you to heal yourself, or fly around. In many ways what we have here is a bit like Deus Ex, only 10 years earlier. It's startlingly ahead of its time. That said, actually playing the game nowadays is a bit of a nightmare. The featureless levels, the nonsensical mouse controls, the picture based menus and commands, the inventory that's on your body… yeah this game obviously hasn't aged well. I'd probably recommend that you play the console version on Mega Drive, it's actually easier to play this with a joypad than it is to play it on a computer, and even with an understanding of how the game works, your first few tries <laughs> you're not likely to get far. Still, this was a big success, a very different game, and you can see how it might have inspired a whole lot of others. It was enough of a success for a special Extra Missions pack to be released in the following year, and for Kevin Bormer it was the beginning of a career that would see him gravitate towards 3D and CGI, innovating a fair bit, and not just in the world of games. Sadly he passed away far too young in 2011, succumbing to prostate cancer, but the creation of a game like Corporation in 1990 pretty much speaks for itself when it comes to the man's incredible talent. Up next we have Thunderhawk, games that you might not immediately associate with core design, but again they're amongst the company's most successful titles. In fact, technically speaking, seeing as there were Thunderhawk games on the Amiga and DOS, Mega CD, PS1 and PS2, they made Thunderhawk games longer than they made Tomb Raider ones. They made less of them, mind you. The first Thunderhawk, or Thunderstrike if you're in America, came out for the Amiga and DOS in 1991 and well, it's not bad. More playable than a lot of military combat sims of its silk, mainly due to the simplified controls. A lot of it involves the mouse, and there's a lot less of having tons of controls just splattered all over the keyboard. The game was largely headed up by Sarah Avery and Sean Dunleavy, who came into core with a whole load of 3D knowledge and the willingness to use it, and it generated a bit of buzz. For me though, Thunderhawk really came into its own when it was remade for the Mega CD and released by JVC in 1992. The flat polygons are replaced by textures, and the simpler controls of the game are much more suited to a joypad than a lot of other flight sims were. In fact, Thunderhawk isn't too far off being a 3D version of one of the Strike games. You've got various settings that you can choose to go to, the Middle East, Central America, the South China Seas and so on, and naturally that means you've got a few different types of terrain. It's pretty cool to see a game like this on the Mega CD, and it's one of the games that really seems to bring the best out of the add-on. The work on Thunderhawk will also be developed further on a couple of other Mega CD only games that we'll see in a little bit. Right now though, we do need to take a little trip to the track for a racing game, Jaguar XJ220, which could be summed up in a sentence as Core Design's answer to the Lotus series, licensed supercar and all. While this game perhaps isn't quite as good as Lotus, that's no bad thing, it's still a very nice little racer, helmed by Sarah Avery and Jason Gee. You've got the appropriate level of speed and, if you play it on the Mega CD, you get to choose some pretty awesome music tracks courtesy of Martin Iverson. 
The Amiga version obviously isn't quite the same looks wise, although it plays very nicely as well, and also does somewhat cheekily feature a whole bunch of other contemporary supercars like the Lamborghini Countach and Ferrari F40 to go with the one they had an official license for. No one gave a toss about licenses on the Amiga, did they? This is a pretty damn good racing game, right up there with the generation's front runners. And to be honest, it's kind of surprising that it's the only serious racing game that Core Design ever put out. Having made something this good, you might have expected them to do a couple more. Battle Core from 1994 is a Mega CD exclusive title, one where you control a mech in a world that's positively filled with attitude. The game itself is more of a technical showcase than anything else. This is a platform where you don't get much in the way of first person shooters, and even if this game has to use a display that's only half the screen and where the draw distance is positively minimal, it kind of does the job, although the game itself isn't one of Core's best, and certainly wasn't treated as such. It's pretty obscure now, but it still kind of stands out from the typical full motion video titles on the system. Soulstar was a much more successful Mega CD only title, and is often thought of as one of the best shooters you can get on the platform. It's a real triumph when it comes to graphics, and it even runs at a perfectly okay frame rate. If you want a game that's the Sega platform's answer to Star Fox, yeah, this is most definitely it, and it also features arena esque stages that you wouldn't have been able to find in the first Star Fox game. If you like this sort of rail shooter, then this is a highly recommended title indeed. Hard as balls, excellent soundtrack, and one of the strongest technical titles you will find on the Mega CD. It might have had a bit of a future beyond the Mega CD. There were plans to make an upgraded version of the game called Soulstar X for the 32X that would have featured much more colourful pre-rendered graphics, and it could have also been ported to the Atari Jaguar's CD of all things, but neither version came out. Soulstar X was cancelled due to the failure of the 32X, and it's likely that the same reason doomed the Jaguar CD version. A prototype of Soulstar X has been leaked online, and there is a nearly complete build of Jaguar CD Soulstar out there as well. There are a couple of other Mega CD enhanced versions of titles that we've not seen yet, but that just about rounds off the titles that are explicitly meant to take advantage of the platform. What to say about Core Design's Mega CD efforts then? Well, they're definitely one of the stronger developers to really devote a lot of time and resources to the niche platform, and they used it to further along 3D gaming, not FMV gaming. This was of course a time when a lot of people hadn't decided where the future of gaming was headed. And core design was certainly helped by backing the white horse early on, not to mention that making these games deepened their relationship with Sega a fair bit. The problem really was that these titles were expensive to make, and beyond Thunderhawk not many of them were big sellers. The platforms just weren't that big, after all. Putting a lot of energy into platforms like the Mega CD, and indeed the 32X, would put Core Design into a slightly precarious financial position, one that we will cover later on. But in the long term, it was most definitely worth it, giving them some crucial experience in the 32-bit generation, where a lot of their contemporaries had virtually none at all. Up next, it's time for some adventure type games. Core Design actually did a few of these, and just about all of them were for computers only, mostly for the Amiga. The Core Design adventures are a bit of a mixed bag. We've got a couple of RPGs, a couple of point and click adventures, and some more action RPG type stuff. Honestly, a lot of them aren't amongst the best adventures you'll find, but they do often try to be different in some way or another, and one of the games on here is absolutely amongst the very best games that the company ever put their name on. Anyway, there's seven games to have a look at here, and of all the core design adventures, well the first name that will probably spring to mind for people is a Viking named Heimdall. Heimdall was the creation of a somewhat mysterious group by the name of the Eighth Day. 
They only have a handful of credits over the course of a few years, but those credits include Heimdall 1 and 2, as well as the platformer Premiere, which we'll be covering a bit later. That's some pretty bloody good credits by anyone's measure, and so people have often been a bit curious about them. Anyway, the 8th Day were a freelance duo consisting of artist Jero Carroll and coder Jed Keaveney, and before they made games for Core Design, they, like so many other Core employees, did some work for Gremlin, principally contributing to the rather lengthy development of Little Divil. It's kind of amusing just how many coders did work for both companies, even though it's now a few years since Gremlin Derby changed over to Core Design. With Little Divil in the duo's back pocket, it's not a big leap from that game to the exceptional graphics and presentation that largely make up Heimdall. The core game of Heimdall is primarily an isometric adventure, one that has a bit in common with games like Bitmap Brothers Cadaver, or even the old 8-bit filmation adventures of the 80s. But there's also dungeon crawling elements. You pick a group of adventurers to accompany Heimdall, all with very specific skills, and you battle enemies in a very typical Eye of the Beholder type way. Other than that, there's also lots of traps to be wary of, and a big old map to navigate around in your ship in search of the great weapons of the Norse gods. All that said, probably the most memorable part of the whole game takes place at the very beginning, where you play a couple of minigames to determine your hero's stats. One of these is the famous Save the Maiden from the Stocks game, where you throw axes at said maiden in order to cut her pigtails and free her from this quagmire. This minigame would feature endlessly on programs like Games Master and Games World, with players having to cut all the locks in a very strict time limit, and it was even once played by the crafty Cockney himself, World Darts Champion Eric Bristow. While Eric had no more worlds to conquer by the age of 27, he couldn't quite get the job done on Heimdall, something I'm sure he regretted for the rest of his life. Heimdall received a lot of notices for the absolutely wonderful presentation. Make no mistake, the graphics are amazing, and also for it actually having a hefty amount of gameplay to go along with the graphics, definitely making it something of a hit at the time. Enough of a hit that it's the only one of these adventure titles to get a console port, as you might expect this port was to the Mega CD. Nowadays there is perhaps a bit too much bloat in the game. Some things like the dungeon crawler-esque battles are a bit of a hindrance really, and they do slow things down. Mind you, this mostly comes into play when comparing Heimdall to its sequel. It's still a pretty decent isometric RPG on the whole, and one that's at least worth giving it a little go, but the 1994 sequel Heimdall 2 Into the Hall of Worlds? That's the better game, as far as I'm concerned. Heimdall 2 is the sort of sequel that concentrates on what the first game did well, mainly the isometric adventuring. You don't have to manage a whole load of characters now, you just get two of them, the man himself and his female Valkyrie companion Ursha, and you can switch between them on the fly. The dungeon crawler battles are gone, replaced with simple action RPG fare. However, there's a lot of times in the beginning where you may want to avoid fighting as much as possible, because your default weapons are dreadful. And of course the graphics and sound are just as immaculate as they were in the first game, nothing's changed there. The end result is a pretty bloody good game, a great isometric adventure that you'll most likely enjoy if you're into the likes of, say, Landstalker, and a lot better for me than games like Cadaver. Of the two Heimdall games, while this one isn't quite as famous as the first game, this is definitely the one to play. However, we're not quite done with isometric adventures yet. There is another one, one that's nowhere near as famous as the Heimdall games, and was only ever released for the Amiga, but honestly, it's far superior to them both. In fact, it's one of the very best core design games full stop, one that gets a massive recommendation from me indeed. So let's talk a little about Darkmere, The Nightmare Begins, a game that of all the core design titles is most certainly one that deserves a hell of a lot more attention than it's had previously. Darkmere was largely the brainchild of Mark K. Jones, an artist who had previously worked for companies like Ocean Software and Hewson. Now I use the middle initial to differentiate him from Mark R. Jones, another artist who also worked for companies like Ocean at the same time. 
Indeed, both Mark Joneses worked on Ocean's Total Recall, where they were jokingly referred to in the credits as Mark Jones Sr. and Mark Jones Jr. Anyway, I digress. Mark K. Jones had Darkmere floating around in his head since his days at Ocean, and he seriously started developing the idea and character of the game's hero, Prince Ebrin, in his spare time while he was working on Space Hulk for Electronic Arts. He then got in touch with a company called Arcane Design to help with the game's development, and while they'd get Mark in touch with Core, well this is where things got a bit pear-shaped. The game proved to be very ambitious, and apparently it quickly grew to be well beyond the skills of the assigned coder. Ultimately, Core Design stepped in, took the development of the game in-house, and pretty much rewrote it from scratch, although still using Mark Jones' character and all of his very well-drawn assets and so forth. Development of the game started in 1992, and there'd even been an in-depth preview of the game in The One in November of that year, but thanks to all the delays, Darkmere wasn't released until the spring of 1994. While the lengthy delays and the elongated hyping may have resulted in a few iffy reviews at the time for Darkmere, nowadays with all of that context removed, there's a lot to be positive about. For a starter, the game is just wonderfully atmospheric. Seriously, it's worth playing this for the graphics and the Martin Iverson sound alone, with just walking around the dilapidated town being something of a joy. A dank and depressing joy, perhaps, but still one nonetheless. While some aspects of the game can take a bit of getting used to, like the inventory system, the main core of the game is simple action RPG controls. Prince Edwin's sword is more than capable of taking down enemies, although don't go swinging it at innocent civilians unless you want the sword to actually hurt you. There's a lot of great fantastical stuff here, including more than a few references to the Lord of the Rings, and on the whole this is a game with plenty of worth, very well written and highly engrossing. A game that was tricky for me to put down. If I didn't have so many other games to cover, I would be devoting way more time to this one. Go play it. Darkmere did get a follow-up of sorts. Dragonstone is a semi-sequel, or at the very least it was initially imagined as one, being called Darkstone at first. However, due to Darkmere's delays, Dragonstone ended up taking more of a life of its own to the point where it is pretty much a standalone title. This game takes a different view. It's a top-down action RPG, naturally with a bit of inspiration taken from The Legend of Zelda. Lots of enemies, and lots of puzzles. Once again, it's a wonderful looking game, Clearly one where a lot of talent is on display. Is it as good as Darkmere? Nah, not really. It's perfectly okay and there's still a bit of that atmosphere, but it's just not as engaging. A lot of people complained that while the combat could be a bit of a challenge, especially with fiendish demons coming out randomly from all sides, the puzzles in the game are a bit too simplistic and seem to be mostly aimed at children. It's still a worthy curio, mind you, seeing as action RPGs like this aren't particularly common on the Amiga, and it certainly has a different presentation to most other games in the subgenre. It should be noted, by the way, that Mark Jones would go on to work for Bethesda. He was part of the art team for both Daggerfall and Morrowind, as well as some of the other Elder Scrolls games like Battlespire, Redguard, and the mobile phone Travels titles. Not bad going, it has to be said. On to the point and click adventures, and naturally that means covering another sizeable success for core design, that being Curse of Enchantia. Now here's another game that went through quite a few steps in its creation, starting out first off as an isometric adventure game in a similar vein to Heimdall, then becoming a side scroller, and finally becoming a point and click adventure, albeit one with a few differences to the norm. The main difference with Enchantia, as opposed to Sierra and LucasArts adventures, is that it doesn't go in for much in the way of text, instead it tends to be packed with a lot more in the way of action sequences. The game was, for a long time, known as Zaloria in development, until artist Rolf Moore suggested the title of Enchantia as something that would be more fitting. The story of Brad and his return home from the parallel universe that he's trapped in is mainly driven by the absolutely beautiful art that Wolf Moore created. It is a stunningly beautiful game, as is the studio's other point-and-click title. 
Just about every setting is gloriously detailed, filled with life and, yeah, it's still quite breathtaking, even now. Where the game kind of falls down is that it uses a picture based interface that seems to throw tons of options at you at any given time, and this combined with puzzles that are often illogical. Yeah, I'm going to be honest and say that while there's lots here that can be appreciated, this isn't really a game for me. If you do enjoy this sort of game then, hey, you may well get a kick out of it. It was very popular at the time, although even a point and click Luddite like me can see that some of the more actiony bits of the game definitely haven't aged well at all. The second of course point and clicks, Universe, was made by a few of the same folks behind Curse of Enchantia, and it was originally started as a direct sequel to Curse of Enchantia, but gradually this one evolved into a different game entirely, largely due to the departure of the first games designer and Gremlin Derby original Robert Toon, who appears to move off to America. There's a lot of improvements here, particularly the presentation which is… well, wow. The game uses some big systems in the code, a super pro adjusted colour system that allowed 256 colours to be shown at once on an Amiga 500, and a dynamic music system in a similar vein to LucasArts' iMuse. The result is probably Core's best looking game to date, even if you don't bother to play this one, just watching it is worth doing, as it's phenomenal. Amazing graphics from the likes of Rolf Moore and Stuart Atkinson, along with some of Martin Iverson's best work. What an achievement. The game thankfully doesn't use a picture based menu, although it still throws plenty of options at you, and there's a bit less of the badly aged action sequences and moon logic puzzles. Definitely a recommended game for point and click fans. The last little thing to be covered here is The Big Red Adventure. Not a big core release, and one they were very much just publishers on and not developers, but this game here is the not very well known sequel to the cult game Nippon Safes Inc, created by Italian studio Dynabite and only released for DOS in 1995, although there was a PowerPC Amiga version in 1997. Core design starting to spread their wings around Europe, perhaps? Anywho, this game follows the adventures of Doug, Donna and Dino as they travel to post-Soviet Russia in a title that's a bit more in line with the classic LucasArts point and click style. Not a big game, but something for adventure heads, and a little curiosity to finish looking at Core's adventures with. Not everything here is a big hit, but it does include some of the studio's most ambitious games, and they certainly show off their variety here. For now though, it's time to go back to what you might traditionally think of as the company's wheelhouse, good old platformers and shooters. There's a good few games of interest there, after all. In this chapter, we'll be covering some of the best games that Core ever made. While these aren't necessarily their most commercially successful games, creatively a few of them represent the cream of their crop, wonderfully creative titles that often deserved a lot more success than they actually got. There's some platformers, a wonderful shoot 'em up, one of the Mega Drive's last great games, an almost totally overlooked top down gunner, and even a couple of decent licensed efforts. So let's not waste any more time. The first game we'll look at here takes us back into the world of Simon Phipps, who'd spent a fair bit of time working on graphics for Thunderhawk and the various console ports of Wolfchild. His next original game has an origin story that's, um, a bit strange. So the story goes, Simon came into the office one day and was hounded by Jeremy Heath Smith, who had an idea to make another Indiana Jones-esque platformer in a similar vein to Rick Dangerous. The game should be moody and atmospheric, and the main gimmick would be that this adventurer would have a stick, again much like Rick Dangerous, and he'd be able to do all sorts of things with a stick. It does sound like a bit of an odd idea, but parts of it did intrigue Simon. He and his partner on the project, Bill Allison, went off and brainstormed various things that a person could do with a stick, and unsurprisingly they came up with a lot of ideas. The dark and moody side of this project went out the window pretty quickly, mainly because Simon Phipps had just finished up on Wolfchild and wanted to explore a different theme, eventually we ended up with something colourful and cartoony instead. 
The end result of the development was 1994's Bubba and Sticks, a puzzle platformer where you control a handyman who's trapped on an alien planet, with only his amazing sentient stick for company. Now this game here? I think it's fantastic, one of the best puzzle platformers of the time. Five big levels filled with creative little puzzles and, most importantly, a lot of humour. It turns out that there are indeed quite a lot of things that can be done with a stick, and usually they provide a lot of laughs. All nice and easy to do as well, there's never any trouble with the controls, and solving the game's puzzles is usually pretty satisfying. It's a shame really that it never got a whole lot of attention at the time, although the majority of reviews for the game were very positive. I think it's a platformer from this era that really deserves some strong reappraisal, and if you were to class it as a Euro platformer, well it's definitely one of the very best of that lot, knocking most of the more famous examples into a cocked hat. With a stick, obviously. Highly recommended indeed. Speaking of great Euro platformers, and a game that perhaps fits more comfortably into the classic tropes of the subgenre, we go back to the work of Heimdall creators The Eighth Day 4, quite simply, the greatest non-Tomb Raider platform game with the core design name on it. There's a lot of really good 16-bit platformers in the core library, of that there is no doubt, but right at the top of the pile? Yep, it's got to be Premier from 1992. Once again, Premiere is not a game a lot of people know, possibly because it only ever came out for the Amiga, which is a shame as it really should have ended up with a console port or two. So, you know, if there's only one thing that you take from this video, it's that there are a bunch of games like this one that you should absolutely play right this minute. Naturally, this title deserves a bit more detail, just to go into some of the fun and unique things it does. You play as Clutch, a film editor who has his reels nicked the night before the titular premiere, and it's up to you to get them back. You go through several maze-like levels which are fashioned into film sets of a sort, with puzzles to solve, doors to unlock, and bosses to fight at the end. One of the many different things here is that stages usually have floors with two levels. You press the button to sidestep between areas. Weirdly, the only comparison I can think of here is that it's like the fighting in SNK's Fatal Fury. This on its own allows for a totally different design, and it's used in some pretty creative ways as the game goes on. The boss fights are another place where the game shines, usually puzzle based, and often with some very nifty touches. There's even one boss fight where you go up against the designer's hand, in something that's very much a fourth wall breaker. This is three years even before something like Comic Zone, and it's just one of the things Premiere does that, well, not many other games at all do. When you add all of these touches onto the game's generally excellent graphics and music, along with other cool things like film scene minigames between each of the levels, you get a game that's very special indeed. It got some pretty decent reviews both at the time of release and on the budget circuit, when it was re-released under Core's own Corkers label. Again, it's a real shame that this game didn't see a release outside of the Amiga. It really deserved one, and the lack of one is part of the reason why it's more obscure than a lot of other core titles. This is one you absolutely need to play, and I couldn't recommend it any higher. There's a couple more games here that were only ever released on Amiga platforms despite being absolutely brilliant, and this next one's a shoot 'em up created by a couple of Danish demo scene folk, the almighty Banshee from 1994. Play as Sven Svardensvart on your quest to remove the Styx army from Earth in this steampunk inspired adventure, complete with absolutely huge levels that are quite simply covered in detail, even down to the tiny little foot soldiers. Upon hearing of Soren Hannibal and Jacob Anderson's idea for the game, Core wasted no time in snapping them up, shipping them over to Derbyshire, and setting them to work, which they did so, over the course of around 11 months. The result? Possibly the Amiga's best shoot 'em up. The action is akin to classics like 1942, complete with huge levels. The first one alone is almost 12 minutes long, in a move inspired by the continuous levels in the classic Swiv. The game's art is quite simply to die for, and perhaps the only minor quibble with this game is that it doesn't have much in the way of music. 
However, the sound effects themselves are pretty damn good. The one regret that Soren and Jacob have often said about this game is that they made it Argo only. You could only play Banshee on the A1200 and the CD32, and that very much limited the game's audience. But what a game it is. An absolutely essential title for anyone who's a fan of the genre. Up next, another exceptional title that only got a release on the Amiga. Blob, a platformer of sorts that is, again, thoroughly different to most you'll ever see, being that it's a top-down affair where you bounce on blocks that are suspended in space, you travel up and down, and you complete various tasks, painting blocks a different colour a la Cubert, for example. The game was just about entirely the work of Jonathan Hilliard, who turned up for an interview with Core Design fresh out of earning his computing degree. He showed up to the interview with a completed copy of Blob, Core hired him on the spot, and then they published the game in 1993. This title wasn't necessarily got by everyone, but some incredibly enthusiastic write-ups from the likes of Amiga Power helped the game along, and few could disagree about the game's originality. There's scarcely another platform game like it, and even if it only ever came out for the Amiga, Blob is a very well-remembered title indeed, adored by several, and often shown off as an example of the creativity of games on the system. It can be a pretty tough game to get to grips with, and it might well be one where I would recommend the use of an infinite lives train or of some description, but it's definitely one that you at least need to seek out. Up next we have another creative little solo project, and a pretty cool game that I almost hear no one ever mention. Cyberpunks, from 1993. This is a rather cartoony game where you take control of a crack squadron of three soldiers named Ra, G and B, and take them through five missions, each consisting of several decks. You get power-ups, grab pass cards, go into computer systems, and generally blast aliens to smithereens. It's all quite nifty actually. The game was created by the fiercely independent freelancer Adrian Cummins, who, as he often did for his games, did just about everything himself. It's a pretty cool top-down shooter, although reviews at the time weren't special, which is a shame. I think the trouble that this game had was simple, really. It had the misfortune to come out a few months after the Chaos Engine, which is pretty similar and, of course, kind of left this little game in the dust. It deserves a bit more attention, I reckon. By the way, Adrian Cummins also had Doodlebug Bug Bash 2 published by Core, the sequel to his previous shooter title, Bug Bash. This one decides to go the platform route instead. The game feels a bit more rough and ready than a lot of other Core titles, sometimes being a little bit jerky and certainly quite a challenge, but it does have some folks who appreciate it. Cyberpunks is definitely the game that's more up my street, mind you. One other little Amiga-only game we have here is Blastar, which takes us back into the world of shoot-em-ups. Again, this is definitely one of the lesser-known core design titles, and not one that I ever hear being talked about much, and yeah, it's okay. This is a multi-directional shooter, largely consisting of stages where you're free to roam about, and you usually have to destroy a few set targets, naturally while lots of other things are shooting at you. However, the game does also feature a couple of regular top-down and side-scrolling shooter stages too. With this in mind, I guess this game is closest to Technosoft's Thunder Force 2 on the Mega Drive, if anything. Playing this can be a little frustrating, simply because I'm not particularly a big fan of free roaming shooters like this, but I will certainly give a ton of credit to the graphics, which are very wonderful especially when they're being weird and warping out, and I'll definitely pour praise on Martin Iverson's music, which is appropriately ravey. Whether you enjoy this one will depend primarily on whether games like this are your bag. It's not my cup of tea, but it's not a bad game. I'm 
going to finish this big old section off by returning to the consoles, primarily the Mega Drive of course, where Core still had a pretty strong relationship going. A trio of these games belong in the licensed category, and as you might expect these games are a mixed bag. First up here we do have a little mention for Hook. Published by Sony ImageSoft, Core Design's main duty here is a conversion to the Mega Drive and Mega CD. The original game was released for the SNES and developed by the Japanese Ukiyote company. Still even if Core's only role here is conversion, they do a pretty fine job of doing so, and I thought it worth mentioning because the Core game itself is a very good licensed platformer, far better than a lot of other Sony ImageSoft licensed affairs. Core didn't do a lot of licensed games generally. Beyond the Monty Python and Jaguar XJ220 games from earlier in the video, the only ones we have are two Asterix related games, Asterix and the Great Rescue, and Asterix and the Power of the Gods, both of which were primarily for the Mega Drive. Both are platformers, and they certainly shine in the sprite department. The gameplay here can be a bit annoying though, mainly because our Gallic heroes always have incredibly short range attacks. Of the two games, Asterix and the Power of the Gods is easily the better one. That isn't too bad at all, featuring a lot of varied levels and plenty of puzzling to switch things up. This one was also a chance for Simon Phipps to create a game based on a comic that he'd enjoyed since he was a kid, and by all accounts publishers Le Edition Albo René were very pleased with the game, giving a personal note of thanks to Simon for being so faithful to the strip. It's a decent game. And last of all here we have Core Design's final 16-bit game, which is, of course, Skeleton Crew. The version I'm playing here is actually the Mega Drive port of the Amiga original, which is a very late game indeed, as late as the end of 1995, and there's not all that many titles on the system to come out following Skeleton Crew, really. It's a nice little way to wrap the chapter up, a hard as nails isometric shooter with great graphics and design, the sort of thing you generally expect from this studio. Super late Mega Drive games can be a mixed bag. They can either be games that get the most out of the system, or they can be… well, they can be experts. Fortunately this is not experts. Skeleton Crew sometimes gets overlooked, perhaps because it came out so late in the day, but it's yet another game that I'm going to recommend, although you better be up for the challenge. It's worth noting that a couple of the folks who worked on this game, specifically Heather Gibson and Jason Goslin, would go on from this game to become a part of the original Tomb Raider team. And, well, at last, in the next chapter, we're going to the 32-bit era. And obviously, that means we're going into the tombs once again, at least for a little while. As we get into the 32-bit generation, we need to have a look at what's happening inside the company. The leap from the 16-bits to the 32-bits was a precarious time for a lot of UK games companies, and Core was no different. They'd functioned for a good few years as an independent software house, and while they'd had a few hits, they were still in a rather precarious state, the sort of state where it would only take a couple of duffers to put the company in trouble. And in a way, those duffers were coming. Even if they'd produced some pretty good work for the Mega CD, and were producing work for the 32X, those weren't big platforms, and the cost of making those games proved to be problematic. Not to mention that due to the commercial failure of the 32X, there was a fair bit of work that never saw the light of day. Games like the previously mentioned Soulstar X, or a racing game named Fractal Racer were developed with the 32X in mind, but both were ultimately cancelled. Another issue, one that particularly irritated Jeremy Heath Smith, was that he seemingly kept on losing his talented coders, artists and designers. It's not as if Core was a bad place to work, nothing could be further from the truth, and almost everybody who worked at the company has great memories of doing so. They just… well they seemingly kept on being headhunted, and usually ended up going over to America. When he was interviewed for the Gremlin in the Works books by Mark Hardesty, Jeremy in particular seemed to have an axe to grind with David Perry, he of Probe and Shiny and all of that, for constantly nicking stuff from Core. Simon Phipps is going to be another one to go in the mid-90s. He stays on for one game in the 32-bit generation, 
But then he's also off to America, where he'll work for Acclaim and be the main man behind one of their biggest and best loved 32-bit era games, Shadow Man. The upshot of all of this is that at the end of 1994, Core Design were in quite a tough position, and eventually, regrettably, they had to give up their independence. Amazingly, what happens is a case of history repeating itself. Who's there to buy Core Design and add them to his empire, one that he's recently made waves with by going public? Why, that would be Jeff Brown of Centergold. This story started with the original core people working in Derby for the gremlin that Jeff Brown had the control in stake in behind the scenes, and now Jeff Brown's got the control in stake in Core Design, buying the company for around £5 million in cash and shares. Just as in the Gremlin days, Jeff Brown isn't going to be the direct boss, Jeremy Heath-Smith will still very much be running the company, and indeed things are going to play out a bit differently this time, with Jeff not necessarily trying to do with Core what he did with Gremlin, or at least not really getting much of a chance to. The brief period in which Core Design was a centre gold concern covers a couple of games that we've already seen, as well as a couple of their earliest 32-bit titles, games that were released for the PlayStation and the Sega Saturn. One of these games is naturally the greatest and most important release that the company had made up to that point, that being the Scottish Open Virtual Golf, of course. This was their first 32-bit title and, uh, yeah, it's a golf game. And as you might expect, it's not one that particularly shines or anything. Sports as a whole isn't exactly Core Design's strong suit, nor does it seem to be something that ever interested them. This is, in fact, the only out-and-out -out sports game that you'll find in their whole library, at least if you count sports and racing as different genres. They appear to be almost unique amongst UK game studios of the period in that they never made a football game, unless you count Sane and Greavesy as one which... Well, it's a blooming quiz game, isn't it? Anyway, this one here is a pretty obscure title on the whole, and it's not too hard to see why. A game that's of a bit more interest from this time is the second Thunderstrike game, another one of their early 32-bit releases from 1995. The chopper action fun continues in 3D, with more campaigns set around the world and lots of missiles and rockets to lay waste to no gooders with. And the end result? actually very good, especially for such an early 3D game. The graphics are a bit of a mixed affair, the terrain is actually pretty good and detailed, although the game does have some very severe popping indeed. The gameplay is much like the Mega CD game, and it works out just fine. Again, it's a military combat game, but without any of the unnecessary bollocks, much like the Strike games. Whether you prefer Thunderstrike or Electronic Arts 3D Strike entries is probably down to personal taste, but they both scratch a similar itch. The Thunderstrike games, or Thunderhawk games, don't seem to be too well remembered nowadays, but they were decent, and they were commercially successful. And, well, that's mostly it. The centre gold years of core design were pretty brief. Indeed, they only lasted one year or so. As centre gold itself started to flounder, with their stock market flotation gradually turning sour, Jeff Brown started looking to sell off the whole thing, and pretty soon he would find a buyer. In April of 1996, he would sell the entire centre gold operation, including core design, to the newly formed Eidos Interactive for £17.6 million, the company that had been formed largely out of Mark Strachan and Dominic Wheatley's Domark. This may well have been for the best, especially as it appears that Jeff Brown and Jeremy Heath-Smith didn't have much of a relationship. According to Jeff, they didn't really care much for each other at all, and had very differing ideas on business. Still, Jeff Brown was around during the development of Tomb Raider, at least during the first part of it. So, we finally reached the big one. It's taken us 15,000 words to get here, which shows just how many other things of worth Core Design released that aren't Tomb Raider. But this is, of course, the game and series that changed absolutely everything, for Core Design and for gaming as a whole. Now, it should be said immediately that I do have an 80-minute video that covers the whole history of Tomb Raider in the 32-bit era, and how Lara Croft changed the gaming world, going through the development of the first game all the way to Chronicles, 
So the best thing to do here really is just do a brief little summary of the game that Toby Gard worked on after BC Racers, starting in 1994 with a male adventurer who then transformed into a rough and ready South American adventurer named Lara Cruz, and then from there to upper class British adventurer Lara Croft. As people like former IDOS boss Ian Livingston have readily admitted, hopes weren't necessarily high for Core's game. They only expected it to sell around 100,000 copies, certainly not the 7 million that it would end up selling. There was still a lot of the old wisdom going around that making a game with a female hero was a terrible idea and that it wouldn't sell, and a lot of the suggestions of changing up the whole thing and making Lara a bloke came when Eidos took over, along with the idea of including a nudie code that was rather quickly shot down by Core and the Tomb Raider team. In many ways, the then nascent E3 in 1996 was a game changer for the project. It was a show stealer, and the game went from being something that had only been previewed a little in magazines, to one of the most hyped up releases of the summer following the expo. Tomb Raider was also, in many ways, the game that signalled the end of Core Design's long relationship with Sega. As a studio, they'd basically always been centred around Sega as far as consoles went. Only a couple of their games, Chuck Rock and Wolf Child, were ever ported to Nintendo platforms, and this soon extended to a deal with Sega for an exclusivity period on a number of their games. By the time Tomb Raider was due to come out, it was already pretty clear that this deal was not going to be extended. The PlayStation was always seen as the main platform for the game, and yet Sega naturally were keen to enforce the exclusivity on Tomb Raider, for a month. In a way it was a blessing of sorts, it gave the team a bit more time to fix up bugs on the PlayStation version, and the hype that the release quickly generated on the Saturn served to make the PS1 and PC releases of the game an even bigger deal. Sony would soon snap up an exclusivity deal for Tomb Raider on consoles, at least for the next two games in the series, putting an end to any further adventures for Lara on the Saturn, or indeed the possibility of any at all on the N64. Following Tomb Raider, Core would still release a couple more games for the Sega Saturn, Blam Machine Head in late 96 and Swagman in 1997, both of which we'll cover a bit more in the next chapter, but as was the case with a lot of other studios, the PlayStation was the priority, regardless of any deals that put games on the Saturn first for a couple of weeks. Now of course, Tomb Raider as a game is a glorious thing. Indeed, it still is today. It's a brilliant continuation of the classic cinematic platformer, filled with tricky puzzles and lots of endangered species for Lara to shoot. It's the big payoff perhaps for Core Design's lengthy forays into 3D that had resulted in some successful titles, but also a few expensive ones. The team behind the game, consisting of a heady mix of Core veterans and relative newcomers, come together to make this… absolute banner. Being that this is one of the most famous games of them all, that's probably nothing that you already don't know. Again, there is a pretty large video all about it. But there's nothing here that can really be faulted, from the brilliant heroine who's about to become the world's most famous video game character, to the game that she stars in. Of course, the monstrous success of Tomb Raider is the game that puts the name of Core Design up in lights. It'll make a lot of people pretty bloody rich indeed, not least of all Jeremy Heath Smith, who over the years has reportedly earned £25 million from the success of Tomb Raider. One of the few people that it doesn't make rich is the creator of the series, Toby Gard. Unhappy with the commercialisation of Lara Croft and unwilling to work on a sequel, he chooses to leave Core Design, only ever receiving one monthly royalty payment for Tomb Raider. Still the rest of the Tomb Raider team plough forward, with another Tomb Raider game coming out every year. Tomb Raider 2 is a terrific sequel, increasing the variety of locations, indeed it doesn't actually feature a lot of tombs, and giving Lara a couple of vehicles to ride around in, and actually giving her a big ponytail that moves around this time. It sells in the millions once again, just as successful as the first title. Lara Croft by this stage is basically a celebrity, appearing on the front of non-gaming magazines, on the stage with big bands, in adverts, all sorts. Ah. 
As Tomb Raider becomes a massive deal, Core Design continues to pretty much oversee most of the game's side of things, while Eidos naturally push harder and harder with the marketing. Obviously you've got the real life Lara Crofts making appearances all around the world, the comic book, and all the other big tie-ins. But in the end, they're nothing without the games, which continue to sell handsomely, with Tomb Raider 3 Adventures of Lara Croft happily pushing another 6 million or so copies out. There's also the critically and commercially successful Tomb Raider games on the Game Boy Color, two handheld affairs that Core Design handled, one simply called Tomb Raider, and the other being Tomb Raider Curse of the Sword. The games take the form of classic 2D cinematic platformers, complete with a massive load of animation for Lara. You can do just about everything that Lara can do in 3D right here on the simple Game Boy Color, and the games are very much respected for pushing the handheld to the limits. By the way, the other handheld game of note, the Game Boy Advance's Tomb Raider The Prophecy from 2002, was not worked on by Core. This pseudo 3D top downish affair was farmed out to Ubisoft Milan, seeing as at this point Core Design had some rather bigger Lara related fish to fry. The Tomb Raider routine continues throughout the 32-bit generation, even as the Tomb Raider team starts to get more than a little bit bored with the game, and indeed the character. They get so bored that they've got a big surprise for the fourth instalment in the series, 1999's Tomb Raider The Last Revelation. They're going to do her in. Jeremy Heath Smith doesn't find this out until the game's pretty close to completion, and he watches the ending FMV where Lara gets trapped in a cave-in with no hope of escape. After all, Core Design has always worked in the same way, even if they're not an independent studio anymore, and even though Tomb Raider has changed their fortunes so much. He's not a hands-on boss who's always sticking his oar into projects, and he generally lets teams get on with it. He's obviously furious at the imminent death of Lara Croft, and brings the team in for a righteous bollocking, although, well, it's gonna happen. Still, the team doesn't get off that easy, as they still have to do 2000's Tomb Raider 5 Chronicles before finally being released to move on to something else. We'll eventually see the result of what the Tomb Raider team did after Lara Croft, Project Eden, when we get to the PS2 years. Of course, all of this is a very brief summary. There's tons upon tons to say about Lara Croft and Tomb Raider, and again, I have a massive video covering this whole period. We will, of course, be diving into the creation of a Tomb Raider game when we get to the PS2. And, well, that's not going to be a pretty sight. But that's in the future. For now, these are the good times, when Core Design are one of the very hottest names in the industry, way beyond a level anyone else thought that they'd get to, right up there with the likes of DMA Design as a UK developer that's made a world-beating game, and perhaps even beyond them. It's not as if Core Design only did Tomb Raider games in the 32-bit era, mind you. There's a good few others kicking around. So now it's time to leave Lara Croft to one side, and have a look at Core's other 32-bit works. After all, you are probably familiar with a couple of them. The Tomb Raider team were, after all, just one part of Core. There were plenty of other folks working for the company, and doing other things. One of the benefits of Tomb Raider, really, was that the games were so successful that the rest of Core Design were free to experiment a little, creating games that might be a little bit different from the norm, and generally speaking, Eidos were happy to publish these games. So the 32-bit games here are an odd bunch. We've got a mechanised FPS, a tank game, an attempt to bring the old school beat em up into 3D, a rather odd cartoony adventure, and a game that spent quite a fair bit of time in development. Let's run through them, beginning with Simon Phipps' final game for core design, the hip-hop tinged tank tread em up that is Shellshock. This game was basically Phipps' big attempt to finally get into 3D, and not his first. Indeed, one of Core's most curious cancelled games is an Amiga title called Retro that was previewed in 1991 and would have been a future sports title in 3D, complete with sprite scaling and jetpacks to fly around with. It got previewed and looked cool, but then for whatever reason it just disappeared off the face of the earth. Thankfully, Shellshock would be seen through all the way to completion. Shellshock, which actually predates Tomb Raider by a couple of months, was originally slated to be another game that would have been made for the 32X. Once again, this didn't happen, although Shellshock managed to survive for release to the PlayStation and Saturn. 
It's a case of a quite simple game that's certainly beefed up by graphics and presentation. It was designed as a souped up version of the classic arcade Battlezone, and the simple tank controls reflect that, but there's plenty in the way of actual missions, not to mention the aesthetic. You play as an A-team-esque group of mercenaries called The Wardens, former military men fighting for what's right in this particular dystopia. The game can be a tough one, you need to tread carefully and pick your targets off, and if you rush in it's pretty easy to get caught in the middle of enemy tanks and be blown up sharpish. Still, it's not too bad, and worth persevering with a little. I kinda wish Retrine was a bit less ponderous, mind you. An okay game, and the hip hop stylings are an awful lot less cringier than some games from the time that I could mention. Lamb Machine Head is another game that started out life on the 32X and Mega CD. Being a mechanised first person shooter, it probably won't surprise you to know that it was envisaged as a follow up to Battlecore, and it's one of the few games here that's definitely focused more towards the Sega Saturn. On the whole it's a much better game than Battlecore in most departments, naturally with plenty of improvements on the graphical front, and a much more mobile mech to play with. Not a bad game, although it was forgotten about very quickly. It kind of had the misfortune to be released at around about the same time as Tomb Raider, and thanks to that this game was kind of an immediate afterthought. It's not aged particularly well, but if you're into playing an early 3D mecha shooter, well you might want to have a look at this game. We have one more game that originally started out life in the 16-bit era, and that game is Swagman. This one appears to have spent a pretty long time in development. You can find little previews of the game from all the way back in late 1994 when it was, once again, billed as an upcoming 32X game. There was also apparently going to be a Jaguar CD version. Geez, it kinda goes to show how big a failure the 32X was when Core had all of these games planned or in development for the add-on, and the only one to ever come out was BC Racers. Anyway, Swagman finally saw release for the PlayStation and Sega Saturn, the company's final Saturn game, in early 1997, and it's actually a pretty good one. Different from a lot of the other 3D stuff we've seen, that's for sure. In this Tim Burton inspired adventure, you play as two siblings named Zack and Hannah who unwittingly summon the Swagman and his minions, who intend to take over the world by making people never wake up from their nightmares. It's your job to stay awake, travel between the real world and the nightmare, and defeat these creatures. This game is quite cool as it goes. It has a mix of pre-rendered and 3D going on, it's got a nice bit of challenge, and there isn't really another core design game like it in the 32-bit era. It's certainly a bit brighter than the generally more realistic looking titles that the company mostly put out, and kind of feels like an enhanced version of something you'd have seen on the Amiga. Sometimes it can be a bit tricky, naturally. Your nightmare form is a bit of a lumbering oaf, and there can be some times where you're wandering around aimlessly, searching for that one piece of wall that you've got to blow up. On the whole though, it's not a bad game, although again, it's one that never seemed to receive much attention at all, especially not in the wake of Tomb Raider's arrival. <laughs> One series that did receive some attention despite the glorious success of Lara, however, is Fighting Force. Chances are, if you asked people to name a core design game from this period that wasn't Tomb Raider, they would probably come up with this one. Fighting Force is an attempt to bring old school beat em up play back into the mix, and was originally a proposal from Core to Sega for a 3D Streets of Rage sequel. There are early prototypes of the game where you can see the Streets of Rage version of this game in motion, but while Sega were initially fairly keen on the project, the whole thing fell apart when Sega and Core had a disagreement over porting the game to platforms other than the Saturn. Needless to say, Sega were not keen on this happening. 
That said, some aspects of the Streets of Rage Origin do remain. You can kind of see how the characters in this game fit into the Streets of Rage mould, and there is one boss that's pretty clearly an updated take on Streets of Rage 2's jet. After Sega pulled out, Core went about taking what they'd done and building it into an original game. Fighting Force was the result, and it is one of their biggest ever hits outside of Tomb Raider. The game is… it's alright. To be honest, it does get a bit repetitive before too long. There's not a particularly big variation in characters' moves, or much of a move list to begin with, and the game is pretty dull graphically. It kind of falls down compared to a bunch of other 3D beat-em-ups that are kicking around. It's nowhere near the likes of Dynamite Deco on Saturn, or Gekido on PS1. It's okay, but yeah, it can be a bit boring. That said, it was still a success, and did get some ports, including a special version for the Nintendo 64, naturally called Fighting Force 64. This would be the only title that Core Design released on the platform, and it's probably the best way to play the game. The success of Fighting Force naturally meant that there would be a sequel, and Fighting Force 2 is it. In this game you only get to play as Hank from the original, and it's more like a third person action game, as opposed to a beat em up. Honestly, I find this game utterly boring, and really don't care for it much at all. It's not a game that feels particularly nice to play, and just seems like one in a lengthy line of third person PS1 games that are painful to look at, and even worse to play. You can probably tell that I'm not a particularly huge fan of these Fighting Force titles, I suppose. Yeah. However, I do have quite a bit of time for the last title that we're going to look at here. It never got particularly strong reviews at the time, but I've always had a soft spot for Ninja Shadow of Darkness. This game had a pretty long and brutal development, it has to be said. It seems as though it may have been built from the remnants of a game called Insane Warrior that precious little is known about aside from a couple of screenshots, which indicate a similarity to the engine that this one would eventually use. The initial plan was to make a game for both the PlayStation and Saturn, but it became clear that the engine and the nature of the game wasn't going to work on the Saturn at all. Eventually the entire Sega Saturn's version was scrapped, and after a lengthy development, the game finally came out in the middle of 1998, having originally been planned for release in 97. The game itself is pretty enjoyable, I find. Amusingly, it often gets called a poor man's Tenchu Stealth Assassins, even though there's not an awful lot of similarity between the two beyond ninjas. Still, even if Tenchu is a much better game, this is cool. Once again, it's mainly focused on beat-em-up elements, with lots of punching, kicking and death stars, but there's also a fair amount of platforming and puzzling to go along with it and change things up. Good thing too, because this game's pretty long for what it is. The main issue with the game is that the camera can at times be a bit of a bastard. The game does largely take on a sort of isometric view, and sometimes it can position itself very annoyingly when you're trying to avoid the game's many traps and pitfalls. In spite of this game's occasional bouts of jankiness, I do enjoy it. Nostalgia goes a long way, and I played this game quite a bit back in the day. It might have helped matters if it had a slightly less generic title than what basically amounts to simply being called Ninja, perhaps. That just about wraps things up for the PS1, the time when everything changed for core design. As we pretty much already know, things are going to be different once again when we head into the PS2 era. We're getting closer to the part where things go wrong. But we're not quite there yet. Core is still looking pretty good as we head into the 2000s, and there's a few other games to have a look at before we make the dreaded return to Lara Croft. So the big old Core story continues on. In the time before Angel of Darkness, we have a little handful of games to look at, and things are kind of getting even more experimental than ever. Even if games are getting bigger and they're requiring more power, Core Design are releasing some of the oddest little games in their history. What say you to a futuristic team-based cooperative puzzle shooter? 
or a game that's essentially based around being a freaking shepherd. That's the sort of thing we've got coming, although we do also have another instalment in a long lasting series that, in reaching the PS2, becomes the only series started before Tomb Raider to have had another instalment made after it. We do also have some projects that didn't see any release at all, although they sometimes appear to be quite interesting on paper. In other words, there's lots to be getting on with. Project Eden, released in 2001, is basically what the Tomb Raider team did next, a chance to cut a bit looser and create something that didn't have so much riding on it. It's quite an odd game, one that can be very challenging and tough to get to grips with, a third person shooter come puzzle game where you control a unit of four people. The gimmick here is something akin to a dystopian Lost Vikings, you can switch the member you control on the fly, and each member has their own individual abilities that'll help you get through the various layers of the mega city. The end result is a pretty different game that can deceive players who aren't familiar. If you try to play this in any way like a normal third person shooter, you'll get stuck immediately, and then you'll be dead soon after. The game was originally planned for release on PS2, Windows and Dreamcast, but the Dreamcast version eventually got cancelled. The real thing about Project Eden is that it's meant to be played in co-op, that's the real pull of the game, ideally with four people all taking control of the individual agents. The unfortunate thing here, of course, is that there's probably not too many people who really got to experience Project Eden in this way, seeing as the game wasn't that big a hit. Even the slightest addition of co-op improves matters considerably, whereas playing the game on your own can be a bit of a chore, particularly with the high difficulty and often quite obtuse puzzling that's going on. In many ways there's little else at all like it in the PS2 generation, and at its best it can feel like an evolution of something like Syndicate, but it's not always easy to get there. A big chunk of the Tomb Raider team decided to gracefully take their leave after Project Eden although some of them would soon find their way back to the company. The final Thunderstrike game, Operation Phoenix, isn't exactly as groundbreaking. It's a continuation of the same sort of thing we've seen before, and not exactly bad for that. Once again you've got various areas of conflict around the world that you've got to sort out in your chopper, all consisting of a few missions apiece. Can you become the best chopper pilot ever, scorching the earth of these terrorists and cleansing them with rocket fire? It's all perfectly fine, although if I'm honest I prefer the earlier games. This game tends to go for a more realistic aesthetic, even if the simple controls remain, and I kind of prefer the PS1 and Mega CD's wailing Top Gun-esque rock guitar cheesiness. I suppose you could say that it's the closest you'll get to a strike game on the PS2, and it leaves this series as one that, for what it is, didn't really put too much of a foot wrong. Then, well, we have Hurdy Gurdy. If you thought Project Eden was a little bit weird, then clearly you've not played this one. Some love it, some despise it, but few can deny its uniqueness. After all, how many other games are there where the gameplay is based on shepherding animals? Perhaps someone at Core had the idea of contacting the BBC in order to produce a licensed game based on one man and his dog, but then decided to take the title in a somewhat more creative direction, making a rather good looking cartoony affair with a mix of 3D platforming and high octane shepherding action with lots of funky tools. This game can be a pain in the arse, of course. There's a lot of different creatures, a bunch of different tools at your disposal, and the creatures well, they do behave accurately in that they'll follow your directions to a point, but they are somewhat easily distracted and aren't totally going to do what you want. They will sometimes just go off course, or break away from a pack, or just be general pains in the arse. Which, well, you can't fault that, really. There is an art, perhaps, in making these creatures not so smart as to do exactly what you want them to, which just wouldn't feel realistic, and not making them so stupid that the game's completely uncontrollable. Hurdy Gurdy just about manages to find the balance. It is, in the end, kind of fun. 
almost certainly the best shepherding game that has ever been made. Again, it got a whole load of mixed reactions. Some people hated this one, and I can understand that, but it is a pretty cool one in my book. It's a great example of the sort of weird game with a high production value that you got on the PS2 generation, and that you tended not to get at all in the next generation, where everything was just completely bloody brown for a time. There were a couple of other projects that didn't make it out of the studio, of which varying bits and pieces are known about. Fighting Force 3 is the main game here. Following the general disappointment of Fighting Force 2 and how it changed most everything for the worse, the third game would be a return back to the roots. Multiple characters make their way to the streets and kick gang members' teeth in. Simple as that. This would have been released for the PS2, Xbox and GameCube, it was worked on between 2002 and 2003, and there's a good chunk of footage and screenshots out there. The team were able to get a few levels to in that time. However, the game faded away for reasons that are, well, they're kind of connected to the next big game we're covering, but I'll just say that following the failure of Angel of Darkness and the events that happened afterwards, Core didn't really have the manpower to keep this game going. The other big cancelled game, which was worked on a little earlier, is something called Nightfall that was worked on in around 2001. Very little is known here, and there's only a few screenshots, but according to Unseen64, Nightfall was planned to be a survival horror game that was based around an island occupied by werewolves, and that the idea was developed after the team had tried to pitch a game that was based around the Preacher line of comics. Apparently not a massive amount of work was done, although prototypes did look good, and it is unclear as to why the game was cancelled. However, one wonders if a certain game had something to do with it. And now it's time to get to that game. We have been building up to Angel of Darkness for quite some time. Indeed, we've perhaps been putting it off. We have, after all, seen many great games from Core Design. They're a fine studio, run by good people. And they're all going to die. Horribly. Okay, that's perhaps overdramatic, but still, this is where the fall happens. And yes, it's going to be a nasty one, like a swan dive off the highest platform in St. Francis's Folly. <coughs> Following their great success on the PlayStation, Core Design were one of the first studios out there to get a PS2 dev kit, with the aim of learning how to code for the new machine and figuring out its well, many different foibles. After all, Lara Croft was obviously going to be a big player in the new generation, wasn't she? There's a big Hollywood film coming out and everything, and it's important for Lara Croft to continue to stake her claim as gaming's most modern icon. To this end, the hype for her PS2 outing early on is suitably over the top, proclaiming that Tomb Raider on PS2 is going to be bigger and better than ever, and that it was going to totally change the face of the series. Work began on the next generation Lara Croft in 2000 with a completely new team taking the reins, seeing as the old Tomb Raider team were working on Chronicles for the PS1 at the same time, and frankly wanted little else to do with Lara Croft after that. Not only would Angel of Darkness be made by a new team, it would also be made by a bigger team, one that was needed to make a AAA standard game on the PS2. Ever since 1991, Core Design had occupied a Victorian house on Ashbourne Road. That was their home. Now they moved to a much more typical and larger office space on the Pride Park Industrial Estate, not far from Derby County's football stadium and overlooking the River Derwent. It was certainly a bigger space, but in retrospect a lot of people considered the move away from Ashbourne Road to be the beginning of the end. The soul of Core was in that house, and this new place was well, soulless, even if there was a reasonable argument to say that the team had outgrown the old house. Whereas Core had largely consisted of, at most, a couple of dozen people in the 16 and 32-bit years, a great influx of new hires for the PS2 years meant that the new Tomb Raider team alone amounted to around 60 people. The promises for the new Tomb Raider game, soon revealed as Lara Croft Tomb Raider The Angel of Darkness, were huge. By all accounts, it was going to do everything, 
Not only did you have a game that was going to feature all the action you knew and loved from the original games, it would have the narrative drive and open areas of Shenmue, the tactical stealth action of Metal Gear Solid, all the bells and whistles, and then some. It should be noted that this wasn't necessarily an original idea supported by Core. There was a drive in Core to make a game that would have been more focused on classic Tomb Raider action, far more in line with what people expected. A reboot, perhaps. This idea was supported by Jeremy Heath Smith, but the folks at Eidos disagreed, wanting something new and cutting edge, a continuation of a story that didn't end after the last revelation. They wanted to be, and indeed were, very ambitious. Meaning, of course, that they were over-ambitious. It didn't take long at all for these huge ambitions to swamp the title and send the project into disarray. As you can probably tell, Angel of Darkness suffered a massive case of feature creep from the get-go, as Eidos pushed for all these huge gameplay mechanics to be incorporated into the game. The much bigger team scarcely had a clue of what to do, and there was no organisation. Management style did play a part here, perhaps. The typical core ways of generally letting teams get on with things may have worked quite well with small teams of a dozen people, but on a game with 60 odd people, a lot of whom were new to the company, working on the big project that the future of the company is riding on? Yeah, all of a sudden that didn't really work, especially when you combine that with the PS2 being an infamously tricky system for coders to get to grips with. Following the end of Chronicles, original Tomb Raider team member Richard Morton comes onto the project to see what's going on, and is dismayed by what he finds. The whole thing's been torn up and redone several times over, everything's in chaos, and just about nothing important has been done after nearly an entire year of development. The team quickly rises from 60 people to around 100, and soon enough just about everyone at core is on the project, trying to bash something anything together. Gavin Rummery, an old Raider team member who briefly left after Project Eden, comes back to the company and, horrified by the state of things, takes a management role to try and save the game. Heather Stevens, another old Raider team member, pops in and asks Jeremy Heath Smith what the fuck's happened, to which he can't really give an answer. The various key elements of the project gradually got cut to ribbons. Originally there were supposed to be these big freeform locations filled with people and dialogue. Paris, Prague, Castle Kriegler in Germany and Cappadocia in Turkey. These last two locations are cut completely, hopefully to be included in a sequel called The Lost Dominion, and the locations that are in the game are hardly what was envisioned in the beginning. Then there's the case of Curtis Trent. Lara's on and off companion in this story is supposed to have a pretty sizeable role in the game, and he's supposed to be an entirely new character, with totally different abilities. Hell, there's even hopefully to be a game of some sort that's centred around him. In the end, just about anything that makes playing as Curtis in the couple of levels that he's got a different experience to playing as Lara is cut. He's little more than a palette swap. In the end product, there isn't even really much of an explanation as to how Lara survived the cave-in at the end of the last revelation. There was going to be, but it had to be cut. Needless to say, these cuts don't exactly put the team in high spirits. The development soldiers wearily on. Even despite all of these cuts, there are major problems with the game as a whole that are proving to be a nightmare to solve, such as a control system that refuses to work in step with the animations, and a camera that appears to have a mind entirely of its own. There's a big preview of the game at E3 2002, but the lack of much in the way of playability doesn't particularly excite people. A much more telling demo occurs at a buyer's conference in the autumn of 2002, where Jeremy Heath Smith demos the opening level of the game, and, well, he basically ends up swearing a lot as he desperately tries to get Lara on top of a bin, wrestling with the game's controls and that horrible camera. Further elements are cut out. The RPG aspects, where Lara's supposed to gain strength and skills as she goes, they only end up featuring in a very ham-fisted way, as we'll see. Despite all of this, Eidos are heaping even more pressure on core design. The game has to be finished by the end of the UK tax year, meaning April 1st, 2003. Core's protests fall on deaf ears. They know that the game is not finished, that it needs several more months, at least. But Eidos don't care. 
they want the game, and they don't care whether it's finished or not. Ultimately, there's little that core design can do about it. You know what the result is already, of course. Angel of Darkness is a monstrous turkey. The majority of reviews savage it thoroughly, particularly on the internet, although naturally there were some ridiculous 8 out of 10s from official PlayStation magazine and the like. Even despite the critical mauling it gets, it still manages to sell 2.5 million copies, although one wonders how many of those ended up returned. Even then, this was below Eidos' expectations. They'd given targets of around 6 million or so to core, a mark which right from the get-go, the company worried was simply not feasible in any way. The whole experience has been a complete nightmare for the company, a truly horrible ordeal where, in the most awful way, time finally caught up with them. The old ways of the company had been exposed in the harshest and most unforgiving manner. Eidos, who have a whole load of shareholders demanding answers, look around for a scapegoat, and sure enough, Jeremy Heath Smith is it. Ultimately, he pays the price, and loses his job, although by this stage he's understandably a bit pissed off at Eidos anyway. There's a lot of word that the relationship between Eidos and Jeremy had soured somewhat. Eidos were unhappy with his management and protection of the studio, his dismissal of their demands and so on, and they wanted things to change, they wanted it to be more corporate. Not only that, but Core Design lost out on Tomb Raider completely. The next instalment of the series, a whole scale reboot, will move across the Atlantic and go to Crystal Dynamics. By this stage of proceedings, Core Design almost finds that to be a relief, even if the whole ordeal results in a pretty severe downsizing. A lot of disillusioned and completely spent coders take their leave. To play Angel of Darkness is, of course, to find a game that is exactly as the reviewers said. Demonstrably unfinished and just about totally irredeemable, it's a game that doesn't have much to offer. You can see some of the potential that is there, at points. When you find another person to speak to, you get a bit of a sense of the narrative drive and the darker edge that they wanted to give the character. It's just that areas like the slums of Paris that were supposed to be these big freeform hubs end up being barren wastelands that are only populated by a few people. There are of course the much maligned elements. Suddenly Lara, super adventure extraordinaire, needs to train herself to be strong enough to open a bloody door, even though she'd been able to do such things effortlessly before. Yes, it's quite comical indeed, a ham-fisted way of trying to include RPG elements, another casualty of the game's development. To be honest, this problem is nothing compared to the camera, which is the game's true nightmare. It tortures you endlessly with its angles that continuously change the entire way the bloody game controls, it makes it an awful experience even to line up the simplest of jumps, it speaks for itself in just how badly it ruins the game. One of the worst cameras there has ever been in any 3D game. There are fleeting times when you see what might have been in Angel of Darkness. When the graphics hit nicely, when Janelle Elliott's voice is so on point, when the musical score really hits, which by the way, in a cruel twist of irony, is by a long distance the best score in the history of the whole series. A truly outstanding orchestral work by Martin Iverson and Peter Connolly that was untouched by the rest of the game's development. But there is nothing that can really save this game from being a disaster. And it was the game that damn near killed Core Design. Just like that, the reputation of the studio was in tatters. But although they've been very badly beaten indeed, Core aren't quite out of it yet. We do have some other games to look at beyond Angel of Darkness, even if this story isn't really going to have much of a happy end. We also have the possibility, however faint, of the studio getting their big creation back. Yeah, that one's going to stin too. It's time for the final chapter. With Gavin Rummery now at the helm of the company, Core Design changed their focus a fair bit. They started to look towards the PSP as their main platform, hoping to make games that were a bit more appropriate for their size. Ideas are brought together from the 60 or so staff that remain at the company, and there's a good few of them, some of which we've had a little whiff of, such as plans to revive Chuck Rock that didn't really go anywhere. 
As mentioned, there is something of a relief in Core that Tomb Raider is now off the shelves. It's a big blow, but with the pressure off, Core now has a bit of a chance to recuperate. They do not have any bad words to say about the new custodians of the series, Crystal Dynamics. By all accounts, the people at Core are full of praise for Tomb Raider Legend, their first entry into the series. For now, Core tries to explore other things. Of course, it does prove to be a hard process. There are a couple of games to look at here, they're not particularly major, and the reviews were a bit mixed. Smart Bomb, the first of them, is a quick-fire puzzle game along the lines of age-old titles like Bomb Squad and a big touch of WarioWare. You've got to defuse a bomb through performing various tasks quickly. Unfortunately, the game doesn't get that many good write-ups and disappears pretty sharpish, which is a bit of a shame. We also have Free Running, which is another strange one, a game entirely based around the art of parkour, sort of like an attempt to create a Tony Hawk style title. There's not many other games like it, and the reviews are a bit better, although again it's pretty far from a major title. It could have had a pretty important part to play in the creation of another game, mind you, as we'll soon see. By the mid 2000s, another company found themselves in a fair bit of trouble, and that company is Eidos. It's hard to say whether the big downfall of Tomb Raider was a critical blow for the company, and many would agree that there was a bit more to it than that, but things are most certainly going downhill, and they start hunting for a buyer. Once again, it doesn't take too long to find one. Ultimately, Eidos is bought out in 2005 by Jane Kavanagh's SCI Entertainment, formerly known as The Sales Curve, meaning that once again, Core have new masters to answer to. It's at this time that things look a bit more hopeful, particularly as Core begin work on a way to claw back at least a part of their most treasured creation. While Core are happy for Crystal Dynamics to keep Lara going, they also wish to celebrate their legacy, and with 2006 being the 10th anniversary of the original release of Tomb Raider, they start getting to work on a reimagining of the first game called Tomb Raider 10th Anniversary, using the engine that they'd created for free running. Over the course of around 9 months, Core Design actually got quite a lot done. There's a good few playable levels, the graphics are looking nice, and SCI are quite enthusiastic about what they're doing. It all looks pretty good. And then Crystal Dynamics suddenly come into the picture, with their own video imagining their own envisioning of the first Tomb Raider. Core Design kind of brushed it off at first, seeing as they've clearly done plenty more work on their game, but in the end, SCI went with Crystal Dynamics. Politically, it was the smoother thing to do. Core didn't have much of a hand to play there. That and Crystal Dynamics could make this anniversary game for the Xbox 360 and other next-gen consoles, something that Core Design didn't currently have the resources for. It's a crushing blow indeed. With this move, Core Design have officially lost Lara Croft forever, and the wind is almost entirely taken out of their sails. A playable prototype of their unfinished Tomb Raider 10th anniversary has been leaked online, while Crystal's game eventually came out in 2007. Of course, it missed the proper 10th anniversary, meaning that it got the title of Tomb Raider Anniversary instead. Not long after this, SCI looked to streamline the company and get rid of some studios, shipping them off for a bit of profit, and Core was one of them. They were sold to Rebellion, losing their name in the process and becoming Rebellion Derby. Of these final years, well, the less said the better. One of their final games is the PS2 version of Call of Duty World at War, and even that's a pretty excellent game compared to Shellshock 2 Blood Trails. No relation to the old tank game, but instead a hideous and thoroughly brown next-gen title that has a horrendous development before being thoroughly torched in the press. At this stage, everyone readily admits that their heart just isn't really in it anymore. The final game that Rebellion Derby work on is an ignominious end indeed. They were tasked with bashing something together out of the complete mess that was Rogue Warrior, a game that had already been in tortured development for several years before an unsatisfied Bethesda tossed it over the pond to Rebellion in 2009. The Derby studio duly obliged, and as they no doubt combed through 30 terabytes of game files that consisted of little except Mickey Walk's swearing, they had to know that no matter what they did, the result would be terrible. Which indeed it was, enough to be considered one of the very worst games of the generation. Some of the older heads in the company know what's coming. 
in a Eurogamer feature on the history of Tomb Raider, old school Raider team member Andy Sandham recollected advising people during the Rogue Warrior development that if they weren't looking for new jobs, they had better start quickly. Sure enough, in March of 2010, the final bell would sound. Rebellion announced that they would be closing the Derby studio, officially bringing the curtain down on what was once core design. It's a sad bit of business really, especially considering the disappointments of the last few years. A lot of people were left to look back on the company's legacy as they wrestled with Rebellion for at least the resemblance of a smooth closure, which naturally didn't happen. The press mourned the death of another storied name from the UK industry, even if for a lot of people who were involved the real core design may have passed on a few years previously. The City of Derby's plans to christen a road as Lara Croft Way would now act as a sort of posthumous tribute to the city's most famous game studio, taking place four months after Core's demise. But of course, many others will pay their own tribute, and indeed, they still do nowadays. There are still people who make a pilgrimage to Ashbourne Road and to the old Victorian house where Lara Croft, Chuck Rock and so many others were built. Funnily enough, if you take the trip directly from the train station, you'll have to go through Roundhouse Road, the address of the offices where the studio came to an end. As you reach the old house though, the one that they call Croft Manor, no doubt you'll have put that to one side, and you'll find your own way to remember this legendary British studio, just as I have. Bye for now.